Among such settlers was the family of Jacob Prickett. Of their history prior to settling on the Monongahela, only a few bare facts are known. Generally speaking, pioneer families such as the Pricketts ignored treaties and royal proclamations and braved the hazards of the frontier for the sake of acquiring land and the opportunity to develop that land into a productive farm to leave their children. It is hard for us today to comprehend how extremely difficult and dangerous a move to the frontier would have been. At the beginning of the journey, there were the Allegheny Mountains to be crossed. There were no roads at all, only narrow, winding Indian trails. And if the perils of distance, terrain, and weather were not enough, there were bands of hostile Indians who, on numerous occasions, murdered settlers on the trail or in their cabins. All in all, pioneer families west of the Alleghenies were very much on their own. They were isolated from one another, with no way to communicate short of covering the distance between settlements on foot. In an emergency, help would generally arrive too late. Attacked by Indians, your neighbor would only know of your predicament once you were all killed or taken captive, and he could spot the smoke from your burning cabin. I suppose you've heard of the Indians being killed at Wailing. Since that time, Indian White Eyes, Mr. Duncan, and Mr. Saunderson are returned, but had hard work to get back. The poor traitors among the Shawnees. No person can tell whether they are dead or alive. White Eyes, on his return to Fort Pitt, said the Shawnees were for war, and that forty-odd of them were at present out intending a stroke at some part of Virginia. The Delaware say they will not go to war, but there is no dependence in them. We expect every day to hear of their striking in some quarter. It is lamentable to see the multitudes of poor people that are hourly running down the country. Such as them as stay or building forts, God knows. Bedford, Pennsylvania, May 30, 17. Unfortunately, the peace following Lord Dunmore's war proved of short duration. When the American Revolution began in the spring of 1775, the British forged military alliances with the Mingo, the Shawnee, and other tribes to send war parties against the frontiersmen, thus tying them down in a fight for survival when they might otherwise have been fighting the British. Henry Hamilton, the British governor of Detroit, supplied his Indian allies with guns, provisions, and military guidance. He further encouraged them by offering a cash bounty for American prisoners and scouts, thus earning himself the nickname Hair Buyer. Although many Shawnee argued for peace in their councils, hundreds of warriors took up the hatchet against the Americans. In small war parties of a dozen or fewer braves, the Indians infiltrated the settlements, set ambushes, and waited for unwary settlers to pass by. In the course of such attacks, scores of settlers lost their lives or were taken captive. When an attack occurred, news spread rapidly. Even a small amount of advance warning could prove crucial on such occasions. And it was for this purpose that the militia sent continual patrols into the surrounding country, searching for signs of Indian presence. On finding footprints or remains of an Indian camp, the scouts used what clues they could find to ascertain their number, tribe, route, and intentions. Should the evidence warrant it, news would be sent to the commander at Prickett's Fort, and from there, word would be sent out by runners who followed trails for miles through the forest, going from cabin to cabin to spread the warning and urging them to fort up at the prickets. Homesteaders would rush to gather a few essentials, clothing, blankets, valuables, and weapons, perhaps even the family cow, and then hurry by trail to the fort. How long a family remained at Prickett's Fort varied greatly. Some families lived at the fort for only short periods of time before returning home. Other, more cautious families would move into the fort at the slightest hint of danger and remain there for months. Periodically, even such long-term residents were compelled to return home to tend crops and check on their cabins. Often, rather than having family members return home on their own, armed work parties would travel from homestead to homestead, taking care of any pressing business. Living in a crowded refuge fort for an extended period of time could create considerable strain. Fortunately for the settlers, Indians generally avoided raiding during the winter months, as travel through the forest in deep snow was all but impossible. This gave settlers a crucial respite each year, even during periods of extended warfare. How many people used Prickett's Fort as a refuge during the 1770s and 80s is uncertain. Approximately 50 families lived within a five-mile radius of the fort, which is to say some 150 to 200 people. 
In addition, an unknown number of families outside the five-mile radius resorted to the fort in times of danger, some from as far away as 17 miles. At such times, the number of refugees at the fort could have swelled to several hundred. When you visit the reconstructed fort today, you will find historical interpreters dressed in 18th century frontier clothing and involved in activities which would have been found on the Virginia frontier at the time. Farming, spinning, weaving, carpentry, blacksmithing, repairs to buildings, tools, and weapons, as well as other activities. Our interpreters, working as laborers and artisans in the fort, will be able to talk with you about their activities, both as they existed on the early frontier and as they develop later when the first communities were beginning to appear. The reconstructed fort you see today represents the original fort as it would have been found during a period of quiet. You will probably not see any militia activity as such unless you are here for a special event. You will, however, find most of the weapons and equipment used by militiamen and be able to talk to interpreters who are knowledgeable about militia functions and weaponry. You might even find a native interpreter at the fort dressed as a Shawnee warrior who can talk with you about military matters from the Indian point of view, as well as Shawnee culture in general. The Prickett family continued to live on the original Prickett homestead for just under two centuries, from the 1770s until the 1960s. About 1859, construction began on what is now referred to as the Job Prickett House, and it is this structure which still stands, a mere stone's throw from the reconstructed fort. After visiting the fort, you might consider taking a tour of the house. To do so will be to move forward through the history of one family and this history of the country almost 90 years from the eve of the American Revolution to the eve of the Civil War.